let every heart say amen. Let every heart say amen again. But we made it to another first day of the week. God has blessed us to behold and to see. In spite of everything that possibly may have gone wrong, it still could have been worse. Amen, somebody. A lot of uh, blessings that God has been given to us. He's been taking good care of us. And I want to continue this morning with our sermon series entitled Better Days Are Coming. And sometimes you just need a little bit of encouragement. So what I want you to do, let's turn to Psalms, the 121st number. And we're going to be in verses 1 through 5. Psalms 121. And when you find that, would you mind standing with us and we're going to say a word of prayer? And I'm going to read it. And so let's, let's pray together. Father, we've come together to go into the preaching and teaching of your word. Father, we pray that I can in decrease that you may increase. In spite of what we have gone through in all of last week, you blessed us and you brought us in safely. So now, Father, we just pray that you can help us to hear you clearly. Speak, Father, that your saints can listen and obey. Feed us, Lord, until we don't want any more. We just pray that our cup can overflow with biblical truth. All of us from time to time, Father, we just need encouragement. Sometimes the tank just gets low. And so, Father, we ask you right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would help us be attentive to the teaching of Scripture, not just to hear, but to heed with what your word says. We ask you that in Jesus' name we pray. Let every heart say amen. amen. I want to read this age-old verse. This passage of scripture, the psalmist says, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills. From whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is the shade upon thy right hand. And y'all just, just, just bear with me. Since we made it this far, we might as well go and finish y'all. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and your coming in from this time forth, even forevermore. Amen, somebody. You may be seated. We, we're going to talk about it this morning. Better days are coming. Yeah. I, I get myself in trouble sometimes, church, because I, I I listen to too much junk on YouTube. And I hear people make these crazy claims, and, and, and I don't mean to say crazy, but maybe a better word would be wild, outlandish. And once the algorithm gets involved, well, they just load you up with them. Worse than the one you just heard. Just driving and just mad to all get out at some of the stuff that people say about the Bible. And one of these claims that, well, who, who 
Who wrote the Bible? The Bible was written by old men in the desert and how they know how we're going to handle stuff in today's time with Bluetooth and wireless networks and blase, blase, blah. And so I have to pause sometime and, and gather myself. And I say that because I put myself in hypothetical situations. How would I respond to an outlandish claim like that. And that's kind of what, 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 what leads us into the 121st number of Psalm. Because the human author is anonymous. We don't know if it's David or the sons of Korah. We, we don't know exactly who it is that has written this song, but in all actuality, even though it may be humanly anonymous, we still know who the real author is. The author is the Lord. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. All scripture is given to us by God. Yes. And it's profitable for correction, for instruction, for reproof that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished to every good work. So even though men may have physically pinned it, it was God, the Holy Spirit, that inspired and told them and gave them what it is to write. And as we look here at the 121st number of the psalm, we, we don't know who the literal author is, the human author is. It's a, a, a anonymous, as it were, but the implication from the psalm still remains true. That he's going through something and he just needs a little bit of help. Maybe he's anxious about something. Maybe he's stressed about something. Maybe he's out of the frying pan into the fire. But whatever he's going through, we don't know specifically what he's going through, but one thing we do know is he needs God's help to step in. And let me tell you something about God. When we look at Jesus in the scripture, he never was in a hurry, but he never was late. And the teaching is that when he gets there, that's the right time for him to be there. Because when it comes to God, timing is more important than time itself. He showed up at the tomb of Lazarus. The sister came out and said, Jesus, slow down. No, no need to hear it and hurry now. My, my brother, your servant that you love, he's already dead. Jesus responded, well, he'll, he shall rise again. I, I, I know he'll rise again in that great resurrection morning. And he just said to us, show me where you have laid him. Yeah. And y'all know the story. When Jesus showed up, he shows out. He got there at the tomb of Lazarus. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. He never was in a hurry. But he never was late. And when we find ourselves in a situation and we're waiting on God, we, we need God right now. Okay? Don't, 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 don't want to wait till next month or next year or next week. We need him now. When he shows up, let me just tell you, that's the right time for him to be there. So the psalmist here has penned this psalm because he needs some help. And all of us, to one degree or another, we need some help sometimes. Psalms, the 120th number, to Psalms, the 130th number, these psalms comprise a unit. All of them are hymns. Uh, uh, one theologian called it the hymn book that the psalms would use and sing, possibly as they were on their way to the tabernacle for one of the great feasts. And as they will begin to walk from their towns and their villages on their way to Jerusalem, you'll start with two or three, and then you'll get a few more to add with you. And then they will just be singing and, and singing and singing from the hymn book that's in front of us right now. It kind of reminds me of the church of old when they didn't have air conditioning all the time. They didn't have padded pews. Some of the old churches would be jacked up on cinder blocks and you can see underneath the church. They didn't have carpet and the best PA system and the closer you got to the church, the more you could hear the singing of the saints. 
You can hear the feet stomping on the ground. You can you can hear the hands clapping in the air. You can you can hear somebody on this side begin to sing, and then somebody on the other side began to sing, and then somebody in the middle began to bring everything together. They didn't have a whole lot of amenities, but what they did have was a heart to praise the Lord. And some of these Jews on their way to the place of worship, on their way possibly to one of the feasts of the annual days of Israel, they will begin to sing these hymns from the book of Psalms. And here the psalmist says in verse one, I will lift up mine eyes to the hills. Yes, sir. From which cometh my help. He goes on in verse 2. He said, My help comes from the Lord. I don't know, y'all just missed the good news right there, but in verse 1, he said, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills. When he says, I will, he said, I'm making a choice. I'm making a decision. This is a volitional effort. In other words, I got a made up mind. In spite of what I'm going through, in spite of my problems, in spite of my difficult situation, I still have a resolve to lift up my eyes unto the hills. Yes, sir. He said, I will do it. I will lift up my eyes to the hills in spite of what I'm going through. Well, I'll lift up my eyes because of what I'm going through. In either situation, I still choose to keep my focus on the Lord. And see, every now and then, you got to have a made up mind. I'm not going to let this situation put me down. I'm not going to let this situation make me wallow in self-pity. I'm not going to let this situation cause me to throw in the white towel. I've got a made up mind. I'm still going to praise the Lord when times are good. And I'm still going to praise the Lord when times are not good. I'm going to praise the Lord in spite of what's going on. But not just in spite of what's going on. Sometimes God will allow your pressure to cause you to praise because of what's going on. The Lord wants us in times of trouble. To put our cares into his hand. How many times have you tried to handle the situation yourself? You didn't pray about it. You knew what the Bible said, but you just didn't feel like doing it God's way. And when you try to handle a situation apart from the instruction and grace of God, your best efforts are doomed to fail. So the psalmist here says, listen, I'm going to lift up my eyes unto the hills, unto, unto the mountains. I'm going to lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. Now, do you know why he's lifting his eyes up to the hills or to the mountains? The reason he's lifting his eyes up to the hills is because he's in the valley. And sometimes you can be so low that all you can do is look up. Sometimes a situation can be so dire, all you can do is go up. But when you're in a valid situation, when you're in a desperate situation, remember to always lift up your eyes to the hills because that is where your help is going to come from. And we have to be careful where we lift our eyes to. We have to be cautious and careful who we look to in spite of trouble or because of trouble. Because who you look to is an indication of what's the priority that's on your heart. The Bible lets us know the author of Hebrews, who's also anonymous, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, the author says it this way, looking unto Jesus. I need a few Bible readers this morning who is the author and the finisher of your faith. There's nobody better you can look to in spite of your situation. There's nobody better you can look to because of the difficulty of your situation than the Lord. We have to make sure that in every situation that we always look up. And when he says, I'm going to lift up my eyes, that lets us know that help comes from above. Y'all missing the good news this morning. 
See, the world is telling you help comes from within. You see, I'm lift myself up by my bootstraps. And I'm the one that went to college. And I'm the one that filled out the resume. And I'm the one that put all of my references down. And I'm the one that rubbed elbows with the right people. See, I know so-and-so. And I interned with so-and-so. And I did this. And the reason I made it is because of me, myself, and I. The devil is alive. Because let me tell you something, if it had not been for the Lord that was on your side, you would have died a long time ago. You see, our help don't come from within. We are insufficient. We are not strong enough. We are not smart enough. We cannot handle the pressures of life by ourselves. Help don't come from within. Help comes from above. So the psalmist said, I'm going to lift up. My eyes. That means I ain't looking at my friends. I'm not. I'm not looking at my family. I'm not looking down and becoming depressed. Uh, depressed. I'm looking up and saying, Lord, everything is in Your hand. Yes. Oh, I got a made up mind. That means I don't care if it's a money problem. I don't care if it's a hard headed children or grandchildren problem. I don't care if it's a spouse problem. I don't care if it's a job problem. I don't care if it's a health problem. I don't care if your in-laws have turned into outlaws. Help still comes from above. The psalmist said, I will lift up my eyes to the hills, to the mountain from which coming my help. He said, all of my help, verse number two, comes from the Lord. Now he tells you where your help comes from. And then telling you where your help comes from. He also tells you where your help does not come from. You see, it's funny how we find comfort in trying to get help from insufficient people and insufficient things. Sometimes it just makes you feel good to pick up your phone and call your friend or call whoever it may be and just pour out all of your troubles into their ear. Let me help you with something right now. Every one of your friends got a friend. <laughs> and sometimes all you're doing is giving somebody else something to talk about as soon as they hang up with you. It feels good to get to the break room and somebody say, hey, how you doing? They ain't really caring how you're doing. They're just making conversation. And you lay out everything happening with your in-law, everything happening with your health, everything happening at your church. They weren't asking for all that. And as soon as you finish with your bread and meat, you done gave somebody something else to talk about. It's funny how we find comfort in calling the radio station. Here's what's happening at my church. Here's what our teacher is doing. It's funny how we find comfort in social media. Let me tell y'all about these churches. They ain't about this and they ain't about that. Your help don't come from these individuals. All your help comes from the Lord. I like to say it this way. You ain't got to tell folk your whole situation. For two reasons. Reason number one, it ain't their business. Reason number two, it ain't their business. Your help don't come from people. Ain't nothing wrong with having somebody you can confide in sometimes. Nothing wrong with having somebody that'll pray with you sometimes. Nothing wrong with people giving you wise biblical direction and counsel. These things have their place. But the ultimate source of all of your help it comes from the Lord. And it's as if in the second part of verse 2, it's as if the psalmist poses a question. Well, how do you know he can do it? How do you know God can help you with your situation? What makes you think that God is sufficient and everything and everyone else is insufficient? I mean, why would you take your cares to the Lord. And the psalmist said, let me give you just a piece of his resume. He said, all my help comes from the Lord, which made <laughs> heaven and earth. Now, I know we got some smart folk in here, but the word made means created. Y'all missing this right here. I, I know you've been in UCA. I know that you got your masters. I, I got you been in UA Fayetteville, and they taught you something different. But the Bible contradicts the scholars. The earth didn't come together because some bomb and some bruise and some primordial ooze came together, and now you got wireless cell phone. No, 
the Lord created the heavens and the earth. And so what is the psalmist's reason for saying that? If he's got the power to create the heavens and the earth, he got the power to help you with your life, Dino. If he's got the power to make and create the greater things, what makes you think he can't do the lesser things? He said, let me give you the resume of the God that I serve. My help comes from the God that is the creator of the ends of the earth. Six calendar, 24 hour days. He created everything that we can see, taste, touch, or smell. God said, let there be and there was. And that God says, when trouble comes your way, I can come alongside you and I can give you some help. God is our help. And the God that we serve has a sufficient amount of wisdom, insight, power to get done what needs to get done in all of our situations. Now, if anybody as a group knows that, surely New Hebrew as a church family should know that. After what we went through, look cute if you want to, after what we had to endure, bounce around town from one side to another side. Nobody ever thought we would land where we landed. Guess what? We didn't know it. And the reason we didn't know it is because we didn't do it. But there is a God that sits high and looks low. That still has everything under control. I wish Isaiah was here right now. He would say in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. And the throne was high and lifted up. And the good news is the throne was not vacant. Because God is still on the throne. He said, my help, I can't talk about you in your situation, but my help, I can't talk about your family, your husband and wife, but my help, I don't know how you handle your kids, but my help comes from the Lord. And let me slide to his resume. He created the heavens and the earth. What a friend we have in Jesus. The creator of the ends of the earth comes alongside of us and gives us support and gives us direction and gives us some help. He has availed himself to help us in our time of need. And let me tell you something. God doesn't just help you when times are bad. God can also help you when times are good. You see, there is a problem associated with pleasure. But what you mean pleasure? It's just as hard to have a deficit as it is to have an abundance. I forgot who I'm talking to right here. It's just as hard to be broke as it is to have money in the bank. Now, I know I, I get you. If, if you like me, I would like to say, well, I wish I could try the other half sometime. Wish I could try the mountain instead of the valley financially sometime. I, I want to see. But have you, have you ever seen people that when they're behind financially and they get that big old income tax check? You know who I'm talking to on this side over here. You, you, you're a little bit behind and then you get $4,000 and $5,000 and $6,000 and just about lose their mind. Oh, that mercy. Now, 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 when you ain't got money, you got a perfect plan. Well, if I had $10,000 right now, I would do this, I would do that, I would take care of this bill, I would take care of that bill, and now you get in excess from somewhere you wasn't expecting, and two weeks later, now you need some gas money. Right. You see, because when you behind, and when things are rough, you know to call on the Lord. But when you get to the mountaintop, then you think your help comes from within. You, you, you think you can handle it yourself. You need God in the valley, and you need God on the mountaintop. You need God when you feel good, and you need God when you're sick as a dog. You need God when you're behind, and you need God when you're ahead. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. You need God in every part of your life. So just because you're a sunshine Christian and everything is going good, don't think you don't need to pray now. Just because everything has finally gotten itself in order, don't stop coming to church now. Just because things have gotten 
better. Don't let your resolve to praise begin to dwindle because we need God all of the time. Not just some of the time. God is not the spare tire that we take out when we have a flat. And then once the tire gets repaired, we put him back in the trunk as if we don't need him anymore. I saw it. September the 11th, the attacks on America. For the first time that I can remember in modern history, had praying on TV. Everybody was on CNN praying. Everybody on Fox News praying. The church had come front and said they filled Yankee Stadium with all sorts of preachers and bishops and potentates and whoever you can think of. We need to have a national moment of prayer. But now that we've gotten past that, try, try, try getting on TV praying now. <laughs> Now that we've got beyond that, I, I double dog dare you to send an email and work with a scripture at the bottom of it. Now that the deficit or the difficulty has gotten in the rear view mirror, we act as if we don't need God anymore. The same God you need with you now is the same God you need when you're up. He said, My help comes from the Lord, which created the heavens and the earth. He said, now let me tell you something about this God. He will not suffer your foot to be moved. He that keeps you will not slumber. Well, well, what is he talking about? He will not suffer your foot to be moved. Well, well, well literally, as they're going to Jerusalem on the feast and in the days of their on their annual calendar, Jerusalem was in a high elevation. So as they were going up, it even is fitting that they would say, "I will look to the hills," because they're they're looking up and they're going up to the tabernacle. But on their way up this treacherous terrain, sometimes their foot can hit a place that looks like it's solid, but it's really not a stable place to put their foot. Sometimes on your journey to the tabernacle on your way and you praise the Lord singing songs of praise there still can be obstacles in your way so the psalmist here in verse 3 when he says he will not allow or suffer your foot to be moved what he's saying is I will keep you standing when you should have been stumbling it's a way of saying I will set your feet on solid ground and somebody here can testify that on your way to getting closer to God and trying to follow the Lord, just because you follow in the Lord does not mean there are not obstacles that will be in your way sometimes. And sometimes you just might slip a little bit. Talk back to me if you can. I, I know y'all so holy you was born in a box, but every now and then you, you, you set your foot in something and you just slip a little bit. You, you, you do something that you know you see. Do you, you, you slip in the way you say something that you know you shouldn't say. But when you should have fallen, the God of Israel said, I will give you stability even though the terrain is treacherous. The Lord that we serve said, I will set your feet on solid ground. The obstacles on our Christian journey will not stop him from keeping you and me upright. And I wish Jude was here right now. Jude would say it this way. Now unto him who is able, I wish I had some Bible readers in here, to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his joy, glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forevermore. Listen, I would say it this way, this, the way the singers would say it, thank the Lord for his keeping power. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all missing the good news this morning. He kept your mind, Lord, had mercy when you should have been crazy. Yeah. He kept you alive when you know you should have been dead. He kept you married when she or he should have left you ten times over. He kept you, thank the Lord, for his keeping power. And guess what? While he's keeping us, verse 3, he will not suffer your foot to be moved. And he that keepeth thee, it says, he will not slumber. 
I drive all the time, pretty much all day. Three to four hours a day, I'm going somewhere. And have you ever, like me, been driving and not really paying attention? Yeah. And found out you done missed your turn? Yeah. You done missed your exit? I was going somewhere and I'm like two miles down the road. I said, where am I head right now? Where? I don't know what I was doing. I'm just driving. Just, just looking at cars and stopping and going. I was on what I would call autopilot. And my mind had wandered into all kinds of stuff and things to what I had missed the mark of what I was supposed to be. But the God of Israel, hey, talk back to me now. His mind does not wander. But the, the God that's keeping you, guess what? He does not sleep nor slumber. The, the, the God that's keeping you the way the psalmist is saying, he is trustworthy. This is his way of telling us he is dependable. His way of letting us know you can rely on him. He knows where he's going. He does not miss the turn he's supposed to take. He knows what exit to get off on. You can lean back and trust in the Lord. His mind don't wander. He's not asleep at the wheel. He's always on job. 20 Four, seven. I found a story. It was a literal depiction of giraffes. And it says out of all of the animals in the animal kingdoms, kingdom, the giraffe sleeps the least amount of time. It says in a 24-hour period, a giraffe can survive on 10 minutes up to two hours of sleep. A giraffe don't have to sleep for eight, nine, ten hours or hibernate like a bear. And there's nothing wrong with the giraffe. That's just how God created them to be. Now, if a giraffe can still function on two hours of sleep, Lord knows you and I can't do that for too long now. The God that we serve still maintains his faculties and he don't get no sleep. You see, that's just letting us know God is always on the job. God is always looking at our situation. You never have to say, where is God? Does God know? Is he aware? God knows everything. His eyes are in every place, beholding the evil and the good that men do. His eye is on the sparrow. You know his eye is on you. And the God that we serve is so involved in our situation. He has numbered the hairs that are pointing. So the psalmist is just assuring us you may feel alone. You may feel by yourself. You may feel like you're the only one that's dealing with a situation to this degree and you feel by yourself and where is God? Does he know? Well let me tell you, God is still keeping you. And the psalmist assures us don't think something has slipped or gotten past his mind. He has not wandered. His mind fully aware of what you and I are going through. And not only is he aware of what we go through, he cares about what we go through. And not only does he care about what we go through, guess what? He can do something about it. You say, well, how can God do something about it? Because he's God and he's God all by himself. God has a way of stepping in and amending and fixing a situation and you don't know how in the world he did it, but all you know is that if it had not been for the Lord that was on my side, where would I be right now? He said, he that keeps you, verse 3, will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall not slumber or sleep. The Lord is our keeper. The Lord, this is some good news right here, is the shade upon your right hand. Now y'all, can we put a case in there and talk right here for a minute? So what does he mean the Lord is the shade on my right hand? And when it says right hand, it's not referring to a literal right hand. It's talking about at my right hand or at my right side. That's the position when someone would stand at your right side. That's where your protector would stand. But what does it mean he's the shade that's upon me? 
Well, literally, when the sun is shining and it's hot outside, the rays of the sun cannot get through the wood, the limb, and the leaves of the tree. So what happens at the base of the tree? The sun is shining, but the tree at the bottom of it, it has what's called some shade. And that shade is a covering, as it were, from the heat, and a covering from the humidity. It might still be hot in the shade, but it's not nearly as hot in the shade as it is outside of the shade. And the same way that the tree stands in front of the sun and blocks the person under the tree, it's the same way that God stands between you and the problem that you're facing. It says if God is standing there and he said, in order to get to her, you got to go through me. In order to get to him, you got to go through me. In order to get to the church, you got to go through me. In order to tear down that family, you got to get through me. And you're not big enough and bad enough to get to them while going through me. Because God is undefeated and he's undisputed. He's never lost. Listen, God is a defender. God is a protector. And if you don't think he is, you should have been there three or four times a long time ago. But God protected you. Talk back to me if you can. God shielded you. Sometimes God has to protect us from us. God will bless us and take care of us. And he means better for us than we mean for ourselves sometimes. God will take care of you. And the psalmist here is just trying to let us know that I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what's on the pipeline here. It might be rough, but if you just hang on in there for a little while longer, where you are is not where you're going. He will keep you. He will set your foot upon a rock. He's able to do it because this is the God that created the heavens and the earth. God still is seated upon the throne. And I know it's hard sometimes. It, it, it sounds real good when we're at church. We got the keyboard, we got the organ, everyone has on there. Something best. But when you get home and slide off them high heels, when you want to button that top button on your slacks and you have some red Kool-Aid and you eat neck bones and cornbread and squash. And when trouble shows up at your house and trouble has a suitcase, you can lift up your eyes and have a made of mind that in spite of what I'm going through, because of what I'm going through, I will trust in the Lord with all of my heart and lean not to my own understanding, but acknowledge him in all of my ways. And I'm sure we got two or three testimonies in here that will say he will. He will. Yes, he will. <laughs> he will direct your path. And the psalmist here speaks from experience. He said, he's at my, he puts the shade upon my right hand. Or he's at my right side. That means he's my protector. He, he's my guard. He's my keeper. Listen to me. There are many of you right now. That maybe you started and embedded on a new journey. And they said, now how are you going to start a business? And you ain't even got no business experience. And you can look back now and say, God did that. Yes, he did. There are many of you probably right now with us or even on the live stream. To where you better yourself, you saved your money, you cut back, you put stuff in the right order, you got things fixed up, and you went from a bike, a bus pass, now you got your own mode of transportation. And as soon as you get above a boot and a shoe, Satan will always send somebody away. Now how you gonna pay for the insurance? Now what you gonna do about your personal property taxes? Now you shouldn't get red cards, because red cards, the insurance costs more money. But then you look back over your life, you can say, Lord, I only did that because of you. They said I couldn't do it, but yes, he did. And I believe there's a yes, he did in everybody's spirit. They, they said that you couldn't be a full-time student and work a full-time job, but yes, you did. They said that you couldn't be a single parent and raise hard-headed kids, but yes, you did. They said you would make it, but you're seated here right now. If it had not been for the Lord that was on our side, where would we be? God ain't gonna help New Hebrew. 
Yes, he did. God ain't going to bless that church. Yes, he did. Look here if you want to. We are testimonies of what the Lord can do. So when times get rough, and they're going to get rough, let me just be honest with you. I, I wish I could tell you it was all pine in the sky. When times get rough, God will still take care of you. And when the psalmist opens in verse 1 that says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help comes from the God, the Lord, that created the heaven and the earth. Listen, that's a friend that's on your side right there. So when it gets rough, you have to have a made-up mind in spite of what I'm going through. I still choose to lift up my eyes and trust in the Lord. Because let me tell you something about God. God will certainly fix what we have broken. God can fix what is broken. Just trust Him. I, I double dog dare you to try it. And watch and see what the Lord can do. Well, let me tell you what else He did. He got a son by the name of Jesus. Y'all ain't have y'all ain't heard of this part before. His son came down through 42 generations, was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and was born in the womb of a virgin. The record is he walked and he talked like a man. At 30 years old, he had his party to show that he is human and divine when he turned water into wine at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. For three and a half years, he had a public ministry, raised the dead, cleansed the lepers, opened blinded eyes, healed the sick. The record goes on that they came and arrested this Jesus, trying to kill him. When they came to the garden of Gethsemane, it was this Jesus that said, who do you see? We're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. And they fell down and took one knee. Peter took out the sword and said, I'm not going to let you put a hand on my Jesus and cut off the ear of one of the high priest servants. Jesus said, I'm going to put the ear back. And Peter, I want you to put the sword back. Because if you live by the sword, somebody read their Bible in here, you'll die by the sword. They carried him from the civil trials to the religious trials. But we were saying from judgment hall to judgment hall. And the devil said a humble word. And Pilate finally got fed up and said, you better speak up for yourself because don't you know I've got the power to have you set free or the power to kill you? He said, well, I can talk now. Well, you wouldn't have that power if it wasn't given to you by my father. They beat him unmercifully. They led him to the cross. They lifted him high. They stretched him wide. He hung on the cross from the sixth until the ninth hour. And the record is he gave up the ghost. That means he died. But early that Sunday morning, he rose from the grave with all power in his hand. And the same God that did that is the same God that said, I'm your king. I'm your protector. I'm your comforter. I'm your shield. I'm your reward. I'm your encouragement. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From which cometh my help. Because not some of it. But in actuality, all my help. It comes from the Lord. When you stand to your feet. As we offer to you the greatest gift that's ever been given. The gift of salvation. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. Salvation is a gift.